because we live disconnected from the natural world, and I'm not talking about going out and hugging a tree, I'm talking about putting your feet on the ground and realizing that the magic of life that exists on this planet is simply because of this stuff right here. Wow. Topsoil. Without this, we do not exist on the planet. This is the essence. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Welcome to our homestead here in Lone Bobcat Woods in the Sierra Nevada. My guest is Bill Wilson, who comes from the Midwest, in fact, Midwest permaculture. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Jenea. It's a different place than you're used to. Oh, very different. This corn is really tall here. <laughs> this is you really this, tall corn. This oak tree. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so pleased to have you here. Thank you. Yes, it was fun. So, how did you get into permaculture? Oh, well, you know, permaculture is one of those words. I think a lot of people have heard the word permaculture and they go, oh, I kind of know what that is, you know, and, and, and I, I came across the term probably 12 years ago. Permaculture Activist magazine's been around for over 20 years now. Wow. And I remember reading articles. It was a pretty uh, simple magazine back then, uh, printed on newsprint and stuff. But there's some great articles in there and it really stimulated my thinking about living more lightly, living in harmony with the planet rather than consuming the resources that we take for granted. And um, over a busy life, whatever, I just it just works away at the back of the mind. And I live in a small community where it's possible to do community type activities. Um, and some of us are interested in gardening. Some of us are interested in sharing tools. We have a tool cooperative in our little town, which I mm -hmm. love, you know. Why does everybody need to own a lawnmower, <laughs> yes. you know, or a weed whip or a pressure washer? Just share these things. Um, we have a, um, a dinner co-op, Monday night dinner co-op, where every, we've been doing this 20 some years and every, like t there's about 12 families and every 12 weeks Becky and I make dinner for the other 11 families. But the other 11 weeks, we just show up and we get to have dinner with uh, all of our friends. So this is basically a suburban or a rural, tell me, a community? Yeah, it, it looks like a suburban community and it was actually started as a, a, an intentional community in the early 70s with sort of a mm -hmm. utopian spin. Let's create the perfect world. And we got a lot of perfect people showing up to create a perfect world. And uh, we agreed on the vision, but we couldn't agree on how to get there. And so the community kind of fell apart after about uh, 10 years. Well, let's just say in that form, it transitioned. But, um, you know, when you have streets and houses, things don't just disappear. And many of us stayed. And uh, so over the years, we've kind of created a little sustainability niche. And we've, we've walked down the path of, quote unquote, permaculture, little steps or little pieces of permanent culture, which is where you're growing your own food, where you're possibly using trees to shade your house, you're not using as much electricity, where you're finding ways to heat your home that don't use a lot of energy. Given right where they are, I mean, you didn't move those houses. No, you're they're just, still what's there. there. Yeah, you okay. can just All use right. plant communities and uh, other ways of, of doing that. We have a windmill that operates our water treatment facility. Uh, it's a wind generator, and it's grid tied. So when it's windy, we're just using electricity. But when not, you know, uh, we pull it off the grid. So it helps. And uh, probably in our little town of 45 houses, there's, I think, uh, seven or eight that have active PV on them. In Illinois, it's not an economic benefit. You don't uh. get ahead doing this. But there are people in our community who just feel like, you know, I just want to figure out a way to live a little more lightly on the resources on our planet. So they buy the solar panels and put them on, and it helps them. So we had gone down these paths of living a little more authentically or sustainably. And, um, and so when permaculture came along uh, for Becky and I, it actually came out of a nonprofit organization we were working in. We hosted a permaculture design certification course, which is typically a 14-day event. We brought in uh, a gentleman from California. Many, many people have probably heard of David Bloom. He just mm -hmm. recently released a book called Alcohol Can Be a Gas. Yeah. So we brought David in, and it was a mind-expanding experience for me. I went through the course in two weeks of really thinking about the, the possibilities on how to live on this planet. And what permaculture really does is it lays out some very practical approaches. And it's not just, here, a formula. You do this, this, and this, and you lay it on the ground, and it works everywhere. 
Rather, it's a design process. It's, it's looking at the elements on a piece of property and looking at, how can I do this? How can I tweak this? How can I bring these pieces together so I'm using less water, I'm using less um, uh, energy, I'm uh, uh, harvesting the abundance of the things that flow through our environment. The wind, the rain, the soil, the sun, these are all resources that we sit with every day and most of the time we aren't even harvesting them. I'm going to uh, speak about that. Here we are um, in a forested area. Mm -hmm. right? We don't yet have our garden. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have are acorns. Mm -hmm. We have black oaks. Mm -hmm. And it's like, as peak oil came, we became aware of it, we realized, here's what the native people lived on. Mm -hmm. And we don't, you know, we ignore right. it. Right. So we began harvesting acorns. But carry on. So yeah, looking at the resources that are there, here's it, a perfect uniquely. example. In this in this environment, you have trees that look like they're hitting 120, 130, 140 feet. 200, yeah, maybe okay. 200. Okay, right. Right. and so you know, in this environment, you're harvesting sunlight from 125 feet all the way down to the ground. I mean, obviously, there's light here. There's light being absorbed by some plants, and of right. course, this is the fall, so it's not too uh, green right now. But during the course of the year, in this particular environment, the amount of sunlight that you are capturing and turning into biomass in terms of just pure pounds of carbon harvested out of the atmosphere and in this environment, it's huge. Yes. Compared to where I live in Illinois, where we have corn plants that are 10 feet high, and for two months, they'll harvest quite a bit of sunlight at 10 feet high. But uh. that's it. You're harvesting sunlight all year round, especially these evergreens, all year round at 120 20 feet. And that's what permaculture does. It looks at how do we harvest the sunlight? And the most practical way to harvest carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into useful things that we as animals or humans use, which is food, shelter, clothing, all the things, wood for Warms. energy or yes, whatever you right. want. Um, the key is, is harvesting the wind, the rain, and the sunlight. And permaculture looks at models to do that. Now the key to this is, and the thing that really brought me to permaculture as a viable, realistic model for us to to look at was the fact that it's not about going back to the caves, going yes. back to teepees, yes. <laughs> you know, and throwing everything technological out. Okay. It's about looking at the resources we have available to us on this planet and asking ourselves, the people that come, to, come here 200 years from now, let's call it seven generations from now, how much oil are they going to have at their fingertips? How much coal do they have? How much natural gas? Even uranium is a finite resource. Mm -hmm. All of these items are, um, are finite resources on this planet. And for the most part, we're hitting close to peak at, on most of them. So we're at that point where we, as in just 100 years as a human species, have found these resources and just said, wow, let's have a party. <laughs> and we just started digging them up and pumping them out. And mm -hmm. just the amount of embedded energy, just in coal, is amazing. But the amount of embedded energy in oil is phenomenal. It's, I used to be a truck driver, and I know that I can move an 80,000-pound tractor trailer with freight on it um, five or six miles up a shallow grade with one gallon, you know, just a milk jug full of diesel fuel. 80,000 pounds, five or six miles in five or six minutes, that, which is phenomenal if you're driving 60 miles an hour. But if you and I had to move 80,000 pounds, five or six miles, and let's not do it on our back. Let's, <laughs> let's move up to the, to the new age. Let's give ourselves a garden cart where you can put 250 pounds okay. on at a time. And let's move that five or six miles until we get it all moved, 80,000 pounds. It would take, I just did a little math on it, it would take about three and a half to four months working every day of the week to move 80,000 pounds five miles. That's the amount of energy wow. in this liquid stuff. And so no, no, no wonder that we as a culture, when we discovered this, and nobody told us, hey, you know, there is a limited supply. Well, who is going to believe that, you know, when there was so much in the early yeah. days? Got a bonanza going there. So we just said, hey, this is the energy of the modern age. This is how we are going to fuel a culture that this globe has never experienced before. And we did. We created a civilization that is quite marvelous. But it was blind to the fact that we are consuming a finite resource. And at the same time, we're putting carbon that has been stored from sunlight, ancient sunlight, in the form of oil and coal and natural gas. And now we're taking that carbon and releasing it into the atmosphere. So we are changing the world that we live in by burning these resources. Yeah. And what permaculture does is look at that and says, look, we have to reverse a consumption model, which is consume, 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 and turn it into a creation model. Through design, we know how to harvest carbon out of the atmosphere. 
It's called plants. <laughs> and with those plants, we can, we can generate oils, we can generate fuel, we can generate housing, we can... Food. Food. Oh, did I, did I miss food? <laughs> it helps. Yeah. It's nice. <laughs> and not only that, but we can restore the hydrological cycle. It's the, it is the plants that bring balance to the, to the rainfall on the planet. When you take out all the trees, the amount of um, uh, respiration going on in that environment just dramatically drops. So that's part of this tactic we have to do to, to counterbalance global warming, is get more trees up here, sequestering that, that carbon the and getting the one. water. So the number one that. response to global warming is to minimize the use of carbon-based fuels. Mm. Stop using mm. them or minimize them. But the other thing is to harvest the carbon that we put into the atmosphere, and that's what plants do so well. That's their job. Yay, trees. That's food. Yay, plants. That's their food. <laughs> Thank goodness. But instead of us planting trees, you know, we basically harvest trees. And yeah. instead of like in the prairies, especially in my part of Illinois, it's actually the great oak savanna systems. And this is where you had large areas uh, uh, of wooded, uh, clumps of wooded areas, and then large areas of open prairie. And uh, the research that has been done is that was one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet because you have the trees, you have the prairie, and then you have all the plants and animals that live in that zone. It's called, in permaculture, we call it an edge zone, between the forest and the prairie. And so you have this incredible amount of diverse, uh, diverse uh, biology happening, and it's incredibly abundant. The matter of fact, if you can imagine, you know, uh, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, um, the number one um, grazer in the plains of Illinois and up in Wisconsin and Iowa and in the parts of Indiana and Ohio, uh, it wasn't just the bison, it was the mastodon. They were the number one grazers. Uh, imagine herds of tens of thousands of these animals moving across Illinois. Wow. You know? and that's how abundant wow. those resource, resources were. And so what permaculture says, look, nature can provide abundance. We know how to take... Um, using plants and designing ourselves into the system, we know how to create abundance. Let's just do that. If you imagine that edge zone between the woods and the prairie, it's that place where the two meet, where you have all the species from this ecosystem and all the species from this ecosystem joining, and then you have all the species unique to that ecosystem. So you have this incredible wow. abundance. So when we go in and design a piece of property and think in terms of permaculture, um, we look at creating these edge zone effects. So you start with a, a very tall tree or a series of trees, and then some trees underneath that, maybe your fruit bearing trees, and then plants underneath that, your high uh, bearing bushes like um, our blueberries is a perfect example, tree. or yeah. service berries, yeah. things like yeah. that. Hazelnut bushes, that's perfect, the, the nut family. And then all the way down to the ground, and then under the ground, of course, your root vegetables, and then you have your climbing plants, which is your squash and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the, we had the most fun a couple of years ago. We throw compost out, you know, onto our little garden spot, and we have this little evergreen behind there, and this volunteer squash came up, and Becky likes to let them grow. So it came out, and it grew, I don't know, 12, 14 feet, you know, out of the garden and off. But one of the vines grew went backwards, and it caught into this evergreen tree behind it and started climbing. And it wasn't until you know midsummer I was walking behind. I don't go behind there very often. And here's this squash plant, about seven feet up in the air, coming out of the top of this of this evergreen. <laughs> Not the top, but out of the side of this evergreen. And I said, "Well, that's really cute." And I pulled back the branches, and here's this beautiful butternut squash just hanging there at about six feet in the air. Wow. Well, that's what these vining plants are. They're understory trees, I mean, understory plants. They came from the forest, from this kind of a you know, shaded part of the forest. And they have these great big things, we call them leaves, but they're really solar collectors. And maybe only 20% of the leaves at a time are in the sunlight. But because they have these big collectors, that's all that plant needs in order to continue to grow. And, to, and, and grapes are the same way, uh, kiwi, any kind of a vining plant, and the squash, they do great in a little bit of shade. And we're turning to, I mean, you sound like an instructor. Oh. And you are. I guess I am. So why are you here? You know, how did you, you got into it deeper. Yeah. What do you do now? Yeah. Um, well, when I get, we got really interested in permaculture. Uh, we brought David Bloom in from California. Mm -hmm. But I said, who's doing it in, in, in Illinois or the Midwest? And as uh, even through the internet at that time, there were very few people that were doing hardly anything in the Midwest. And so um, basically I, I was a little depressed that there weren't, wasn't more going on. I was, well, what do I have to do, move to California, you know, <laughs> or, or out east? I mean, there's a clump of folks out in the Northeast. There's some folks in the Southwest. 
and in California that are doing some great work in Northwest as well. Great, great permaculture work, but not much in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. But I found these two unusual characters that not only were doing a lot of permaculture, but we're doing some teaching and we're pretty good instructors. And so I asked the two of them if, if they would be interested in co-teaching a permaculture design course. One guy's from Southern Wisconsin, the other one's from Southern Illinois, uh, Wayne Weissman from uh, Southern Illinois and Mark Shepard. And uh, actually they were kind of a little bit angry with me to say, who's Mark Shepard? Who's Wayne Weissman? You know, like, who are these, who is this guy? You know, I mean, well, you want me to teach with someone? I don't even know who he is. What has he done, you know? <laughs> So I send them each other's information and they can't believe what the other person is mm -hmm. doing. So we got together and they said, absolutely, we'd love to teach a course together. So two years ago, this month, uh, October. Okay, 06. 06, in, yeah, in, that's in, right. Let's put 06, a date on it. Right. Um, we hosted our first permaculture course and it was just, it was phenomenal. It was a fabulous course because both of these guys not only have walked the talk, but they understand the heart of the permaculture message. It's not about where you put your plants, how you build your house. I mean, those are all important factors of the physical aspect of it. But they also bring to the permaculture conversation the reasons why we need to do it in the first place. Tell me about that. Tell me about the heart of that. Because obviously that spoke to you, yeah. and it's something you're transmitting in the courses you're doing, including one right here. Yeah. Out yes. here in California yourself. In Grass Valley, Redhead. yeah. What's, what's at the heart? What's the essence there? Well, you know, this is that part that's kind of hard to put your finger on. This is the best way I can describe it. I think that we have created a culture that is pretty much disconnected from reality. You know, we're basically living a life pretty unconsciously. We fall into these roles where I have to make a living, I have to have a job, I'm going to get married, I have to have children. And we just go through this motion of of accepting what is, and that, of course, I have to have TV, I have to consume things because that's all there is. I have to have a dishwasher and a this and a this. It's just the way it was laid out in front of us, and nobody has really questioned it in a, in a big way. And because we live disconnected from the natural world, and I'm not talking about going out and hugging a tree, I'm talking about putting your feet on the ground and realizing that the magic of life that exists on this planet is simply because of this stuff right here, wow. topsoil. Without this, we do not exist on the planet. This is the essence of us being alive today. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We all came from this, we all return to this. And wow. if you have great stuff of that, we can have abundance around us. That is the essence. And so, so because people, we're living in this culture, we're disconnected from reality. We're disconnected from one another. We have created a culture we call a community, but we don't even know our neighbor. You know, we don't even know how to get along. Just as we lost the ability to know how to grow food, to know how to preserve food, to know how to heat ourselves in the winter when it's cold, we have lost, to a great extent, the ability to be patient with one another. That's true. Yeah. That's We've true. lost the ability, I think, to see the magic in others, to see the miracle or the beauty. You know, sounds a little Pollyannish. It might but sound woo-woo, but I think it's, it's, it's in there. It's there. And I think that that may speak to the hunger that so many people and the alienation so many right. people in our culture feel. It's they don't know there. what it is they're missing. It is there and it's there in all of us. And there are times when we feel it and there are mm -hmm. times when we know it. But there's no one else around us really oftentimes because of the way we've set things up that can understand what we're saying or feeling. We don't even know how to put it into words. That's where I was at. I don't even know how to express why am I feeling discontent with my life? Why do I feel like everything is, is, un is unsatisfying? Even if I had good paying jobs, even if I had uh, the nice home, and even though my kids are wonderful, how come I still feel like I'm disconnected? How do I feel dissatisfied? And the reason is because we're not living in alignment with what really exists. We are, we've created an artificial world, an artificial culture, yeah. Yeah. and what we are aching for is an experience of being alive on the planet as being a spiritual human animal on this planet. And so that is the piece that Mark and Wayne bring to permaculture. That's the piece that I bring to it as well. We don't talk about it a lot, you know, but we do talk about the essence of it. And what's amazing is the people who tend to be attracted to our courses or permaculture co course, most people. You know, when you invest over $1,000 in a week to two weeks of your time, you don't do that frivolously. Yeah. Most people who take these design courses have stepped out of the box. They're asking the questions. They're looking at life questioning, there's got to be more. Yeah. And when they show up at these courses that we do anyway, um, it's, that, that understanding is solidified. They get it. 
and they all of a sudden, they walk away saying, I know what to do now. They make a shift in their thinking and their beingness, actually, and they make a commitment to continue to walk the path. Because they've been walking, a lot of folks are walking that path alone. Even their spouse doesn't get them. Yeah. And then you yeah. come to a course with 25 or 40 people, however many is in a course, and you're surrounded by people who feel the same way you do. You get it. You're not crazy. You're not, you're not, you're not nuts. That it's real. And there's a place you can go and there's things you can do. I think we need that because what we're doing is we're stepping outside of a consensus reality, our culture that says, here's the way it is, as you described it earlier. And you step outside, it can feel real lonely. Mm -hmm. And part of what you've done is build some, some solidness. Here in our last five or six minutes, mm -hmm. I also want to cover, Thanks. you do your course in a kind of unique way. I mean, I'm not here to sell the class, and mm -hmm. I know that it's, what, two weeks worth of to be really certified. Yeah. You do something different. What's that? Well, we couldn't find a two-week period when both Mark and Wayne were available, you know. Um, and so uh, Becky and I had had some experience in the nonprofit work we had done and uh, of, of setting up webinars and using the Internet. It is amazing what kind of a connection you can actually make where, you're, you're, you know, where people are you're, you're sharing images, you're sharing voice, you're sharing a text feature where people can ask questions through a little text, and it's all happening simultaneously. It is amazing what a strong sense of community you can create in that environment. Interesting. So we have taken part of the course. We do uh, webinars ahead of time. There are six two-hour webinars that we do. And Mark and Wayne cover a lot of the fundamentals and the basics of permaculture, right. kind of the textbook stuff, you right. might say. But it's very, they do a great job. It's engaging. Most folks you know, love the webinars. And by the time, we weren't counting on this, but by the time the webinars were done, people were so excited, they could hardly wait to get to the course to meet everybody because you're talking and you're texting with one another and you're getting to know who each other's are. So we then took the course and instead of having it uh, over 13 days, most courses run two weeks with a day off, so it's like 13 days. What we do is we do, an, we do it in eight days now. We do 12 hours ahead of time, mm -hmm. the balance of the 60 hours. These are long days. We start at eight in the morning, <laughs> we go to 10 at night, and there's some nice breaks in there in between, but it's a long day. But we, we really, it's a fabulous week. We pack it in. And um, what we discovered when we offered this, we were hoping to get maybe 10 or 12 people to show up for our course. Our first course had 37 people in it. And almost to the person, we said, well, how come you chose our course? And they said, look, I can find the money. I can't find two weeks. Yes. I don't have two weeks, but I can find a week. And so they showed up at our course because they had the week. And so we just kind of stumbled into this, this formula, but it seems to be working incredibly well. And not only that, you can get it done in a week. Just like nature, you're adapting Mm -hmm. You're adapting, adapting to your, your learn to the environment, to your people. And I'm glad you brought that up because permaculture is not just about how we work with the natural environment. It's about how you design your energy. How do you use your energy? So it has to do with how you maybe put things in your home. It has to do with how you set up your business. It has to do with um, when you're making choices to who you're going to work with, do you work with people that you resonate with mm. and that bring the same passion that you have to the project or do you just take someone who ha who's qualified because they have this long list of credentials? Yeah. You know, you start following your heart. When you start moving into a more permanent culture where you're living in alignment with, with what exists on the planet, there's, a, there's an energy that goes through, I think, through all of us. And I don't know what to call it, but it's kind of like a love energy, I think. You know, it's, it could be neutral, but I think it, it, it's on the love side. But when you start living that way, you start... Um, you start uh, asking questions from the heart rather than from the mind. And you start living from the heart. You start making decisions like you and Robin starting this program. Well, thank you. You know, yeah. you didn't look at the bottom, you didn't look at the spreadsheet and look at the bottom line and say, holy cow, this is a gold mine. Let's go, girl. No. No, That's you looked sure. at it and said, we have to do this. Yeah. This is yeah. who we are. The heart, the heart said, right. it's like, I care about how people are going to respond. What can we do in the face of these That's changes? Right. And you don't know how it's going to work out. Exactly. You don't know how you're going to put it together. And, <laughs> and month to month, <laughs> season to season, you're still doing it. We figure it out as That's we go right. along. But have you ever felt more alive than you have in the last two years? You asked the right question. Yeah. I'm doing it because our passion is here, not because the bottom line is good, because it's, you know, it's shaky. It's shaky yeah. But it, it's, it's fulfilled something, that indefinable something that you're talking about, yeah. that I know that people are telling us. It's yeah. reaching them. It's, they're changing their lives. And what yeah. else? We all have to get up matter. in the morning 
we all have to get dressed and we all have to spend our day doing something. Why don't we do something that is who we are, that speaks to our heart, that we can speak to others, and possibly even it would make a difference in the world? I mean, what if we were to create a world that worked for everybody? What if we did that? I mean, we got to get up in the morning anyway. Why don't we do that? You know, we could get up in the morning and just consume the planet, you know, or we can get up in the morning and say, let's figure out a way not to consume the planet and let's figure out a way to create a world that works for everybody. Where the connections are made, where mm -hmm. the hearts are opened, we're back in connection with everything. Where in you our actually lives. create common unity, community. The community with plants, with the soil, with each other, with our work. It's all there. It couldn't be better. Yeah, it's all there. It's just connecting the dots and moving in that direction. Bill, this is, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I knew that was a wonderful presentation. This is even richer because you're bringing so much more of your whole being yeah. to this. Yeah. Thank you for being here on this planet at this time in our community. It's a lot of this fun, conversation. Isn't it? it sure <laughs> is. Well, I, I was raised in a suburban situation on cornflakes and white bread. And I don't think I had original thought until I was probably 21 years old. I just woke up and I said, Holy cow, there's got to be more than TV and cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and anyway. you're doing it. So it's just a path, you know, and it's just, there's a great quote by Thoreau. He says, you know, when one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams, and these are the dreams of the heart. There's one thing Walt Disney got right a dream is a wish your heart makes, not your mind. The dreams of the mind is the one that builds skyscrapers and consume oil. When one advances confidently in the direction of their own dreams and they endeavor to live the life, which they have imagined for themselves. They meet with success, unexpected, and in common hours. Isn't that the way it happens? You know, there's no band. You know, every time something breaks through and you have a success, there's no band there. There's no way, you know, nobody sends you a letter, you know, saying congratulations. There's no degree. But your heart But knows. you feel it. You just absolutely and are I connected. would add that probably, unseen to us, the universe is different because of that. Yeah, there's a band. There's a band playing, I think. When those things connect, we just don't see it. <laughs> Not right. with these ears, anyway. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You for Thank this. you. Thank you for your work, you and Robin. Thank it's you. just marvelous what you're doing. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and my guest is Bill Wilson of Midwest Permaculture. If you value these shows, come to our website, www.peakmoment.tv, and contribute. Thank you.